Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come back. back. Isn't that Everybody so? You tried to get into the locked drawer today, didn't you? The Urtonwood Ghost by Eleanor Glynn. One. Mrs. Charters arrived at Euston in plenty of time for the 2.30 train to Isleton. She was a woman who was well served, and her footman had already got her all that she required, and she retired with a paper to the farther side of the compartment. You need not wait, Thomas, she said. There will probably be no one else getting in, and it is a corridor train. So Thomas touched his hat and left. Just before the guard gave the signal to start, a man, evidently a gentleman, opened the door of the carriage and entered. He had been walking leisurely up and down the platform, and, if she had known it, had observed her maid and footman, looked at her luggage and ascertained her destination. It was the same as his own, Ertonwood Manor, that really charmingly romantic old place Ada Hardress and her obedient husband had just taken from the Walworths for a year. It is too exquisitely ghostly, pet, she had written to Estelle Charters, creaking panelling, underground passages, haunted library, and a big cedarwood bedroom where the white lady appears. There's no electric light, and a person with your sensibilities can be perfectly certain to receive a thrill. Come and spend Christmas with us. And Mrs. Charters had accepted, won by this alluring description, and was now, the day before Christmas Eve, on her way thither. She was a tall, slender woman of twenty-eight or thirty, perhaps, she was not beautiful, but every single thing she put on seemed to enhance her grace. Rather plaintive and distinguished refinement appeared to be the note which first struck strangers about her. That bore Algernon Alexander Charters had joined friends in another world some three years before this Christmas Eve, leaving his widow most comfortably provided for. Only an unpleasant jar had happened not more than a week ago. The family lawyer had written to inform Estelle that there might be serious trouble ahead, and it might even eventualize in her loss of most of Algernon and Alexander's money if a certain marriage certificate could not be found. The whole fortune was being claimed by a descendant of the great-great-grandfather, who contended that Algernon and Alexander himself had enjoyed his ten or twelve thousand a year unlawfully. It appeared that somewhere about 1795, the rich Alderman Charters's son, delighting to move in circles above him, had contracted a marriage secretly with the daughter of a decayed noble who would have none of him, and the lady, regretting her mistake too late, had denied all connection with him, and willingly relinquishing her son, whose existence she had concealed, and of whom she was ashamed, she had retired with her father to Italy and there, a year or two later, had died, the wife of an Italian count. The abandoned rich city husband had apparently taken the casual behaviour of the noble lady in a philosophical spirit, doting upon her son, on whom, although he married again and had a number of other children, he left the bulk of his great fortune. These second families seemed to have been complacent people and had accepted their fate, but now one of their descendants had come forward and claimed that the will of John Charters expressly stating to my legitimate eldest son and his heirs, with no name given, the property should come to him as the lineal representative of the eldest son of the second family, there being no proof to be found anywhere of the first marriage with the Lady Marjorie Wildacre. Mrs. Charters thought of all these things as she sat on the train, her attention had scarcely wandered from them even as she glanced up at the intruder in her carriage, but she did casually notice that he was a thin, dark man with something rather attractive looking about him, and after a while she became conscious that his eyes were fixed upon her, and she felt compelled to look up. They were too close together, uh, the orbs that met hers, she decided, though their size and shape left nothing to be desired. She had a foolish shiver of foreboding and dislike as she turned away, and let her mind revert to the ceaseless question of where on the face of the earth this certificate could be, and how were they to find it. Presently the stranger leaned forward and said in a most cultivated voice, which yet had a foreign accent somewhere lurking in the background, You are Mrs. Charters, I believe, or we are both going to the same house. May I introduce myself? I am Ambrose Duval. I am afraid not quite an Englishman. 
His voice was so pleasant it made you forget the sinister impression left by his eyes. Mrs. Charters was of the world and not easily disconcerted. She bowed politely and a conversation began, in the course of which it became apparent that Mr. Ambrose Duval, such a name, it reminds one of Claude, she thought, had met the hardresses abroad and had renewed his acquaintance lately and was coming down now to this Christmas party. Nothing could be more polished and smooth than his manner. It had that easy gliding from one subject to another which makes so agreeable a conversationalist. He skimmed all sorts of interesting topics, and at last arrived at English architecture. Ertonwood is a very romantical place, Mrs. Hardress tells me, he said, a fine specimen of Tudor style with additions of Jacobean. I am longing to study it. Do you know its history? Not in the least, Estelle replied. My friend Ada Hardress merely wrote I should be certain to see ghosts. I love the thought of them, although I have never been fortunate enough to encounter one. Have you? And she smiled her fascinating, elusive smile that was half melancholy and half gay. Sir George Seafield, who had already arrived at Ertonwood earlier in the day, thought Estelle Charters' smile the most divine thing in the world, but then he was in love. Resentfully so at first, then resignedly, and now abjectly. Ambrose Duval, on the contrary, mused, She is no fool for all her gentleness. It is a capable mouth. Perhaps her innocence about Ertonwood is all bluff, and she is bent upon the same errand as myself. I must lose no time. By four o'clock, when they had reached Isleton, they had each taken stock of the other. He makes me creep down my back, was Mrs. Charters's comment, although I do feel he is attractive. Some more guests got out of another carriage, and there were greetings and chaff, and the whole party entered motors and were whirled to their destination. Here all was holly and mistletoe and everything to make a real English Christmas. Huge log fires in every grate, and quantities of wax candles tried to make up for the want of electric light. Nothing could have looked more like a storybook description of things as they once were in the good old days. Ada Hardress gave her friend a most gushing welcome, and contrived that Sir George Seafield secured a chance for a tete-a-tete -tete word in a suitable window-seat as they drank tea. "'You are cruel to me,' he said, looking devotedly at the lady of his heart with his keen blue eyes, "'promising to be at the junction, and never turning up by that train. I came down from Scotland on purpose.' and thought I should have been allowed to take care of you from crew here. I can take care of myself, she protested softly, and I found I wanted to shop this morning before I left. You think you're capable of looking after yourself always, under any circumstances, I suppose, he hazarded. But of course, when I feel I cannot, then I shall tell you. And she smiled. I pray fate to let the chance come sooner than you think, he announced fervently. But at this pious hope Mrs. Charters only looked sweetfully disdainful and changed the conversation to less personal things. "'You won't be a goose, darling, and snub Sir George to death, will you?' Ada Hardress begged as she took her friend up the stairs. "'You're so provoking with your aloof air, and now wanting to rest until dinner when he's dying to talk to you.' But Mrs. Charters was unimpressed. "'I am really tired, Ada, and it does Englishmen good to be made to wait.' I learned that in America, she said. Algernon took me there when I wanted to go to Rome, but I never regretted it. I acquired so many hints from those clever women. Oh, what a heavenly place, she added, when they got to the cedar chamber which had been allotted to her. Fancy it's not having been spoilt in these modern days. For it was all panelled and hung with faded orange silk in its three tall windows and capacious four-post bed. And presently, when Mrs. Charters was tucked up upon the rather hard sofa, preparing to have a siesta before dinner, she felt at peace with all the world. It was not long before she was sound asleep, and here she had a strange dream. She felt herself unaccountably moved and perturbed. She had a sensation of breathless, waiting tension while she stood in some dark place, and suddenly it seemed as though only one spot in the blackness became illuminated, and then she saw an old escritoire. Uh, there was nothing else, no furniture, no room, 
nothing but this old writing bureau standing in space, and there, on it, lay unfolded a yellow parchment, upon which seemed to have fallen some drops of fresh blood. Estelle woke with a sensation of supernatural excitement and fear, and then she reasoned with herself. Could anything have been more foolish? A dream with no incident, no personages, no action to cause such a feeling. There was something uncanny about it, though. What if the room were really haunted? She was not sure she liked it, after all. She got up quickly and rang for her maid, glad to have company and lights, but all the while she dressed she saw nothing but the escritoire, the parchment, and the three drops of blood. "'You look pale and pathetic,' Sir George Seafield told her, with tender anxiety in his voice as they went into dinner. "'What has happened? I want to know.' But it was not until about the first entree that he could get her to unfold her dream. Her other-hand neighbour was the attractive half-foreigner who had come down in the train with her, and who had no intention of allowing her legitimate partner to monopolise the conversation. He listened attentively, as she described minutely the strange incident to Sir George, bending forward so as not to lose a word, much to that gentleman's disgust. "'I hate the brute,' he thought. "'Why cannot he attend to the woman he has taken in?' "'What a very strange dream,' Mr. Ambrose Duval said. "'And where was this Critoire? Uh, you have no idea?' "'Not in the least,' replied Estelle. "'It was all in space.' "'But why the blood?' And then a thought struck her. "'Of course!' she exclaimed. "'This is some vision sent to tell me where I am to find a most important document. "'How stupid of me never to have thought of it before!' "'A document?' both men asked. But while Sir George's eyes only expressed deep admiration for the lady herself, Mr. Ambrose Duval's had a concentrated eagerness to hear her words that was arresting. Why should this interest him so? wondered Sir George, and it caused him to feel puzzled and irritated. Mrs. Charters was no chatterer, and not in the habit of imparting her private affairs to strangers, so she laughed and changed the conversation now to lighter things, dividing her time equally between the two men, until the ladies rose to leave the room. Sir George Seafield was incensed. Why had his good friend Ada Hardress asked this foreigner to Ertonwood, and why had she put him next to Estelle, the lady of his heart? I believe she is rather drawn towards the jackanapes, he thought, angrily to himself, and with difficulty kept from sparring with him as they sat over the port. "'Ada, where did you meet Mr. Duval?' Mrs. Charters asked, as a group of women hung over the big drawing-room fire. "'He seems a, an interesting creature.' "'Doesn't he?' several of them chimed in. "'Mysterious and delightful,' one affirmed. "'So good-looking,' another announced. "'His eyes are too close together,' old Miss Harcourt said in a sententious way. "'I shan't play bridge with him.' "'We met him in Hungary last summer,' the hostess at last got in. It seems absurd, but he was a hotel acquaintance, only he knew such a lot of people we did, he seemed like an old friend, and we saw him often. And he was always cheery and nice. He has relations in England that he's come to look up. I'm so glad you find him attractive. I do myself. He has been too charming this last fortnight when we were up in town for Christmas shopping. He had just arrived from Paris, and I have never had so delightful a companion, so I asked him down for Christmas. He said he would be lonely, and is so absorbed in the study of old houses. Then someone began to play the piano, and the group broke up, and soon the gentlemen joined them, and a general move to the big oak-panelled hall commenced, when the younger members started a valse, while the fiddlers three, who had come down from London to entertain the yuletide guests, played merrily. Sir George Seafield was detained by his host for a second, and had the chagrin to see Mrs. Charters whirling in the arms of the foreigner. He shut his firm jaw with an ominous snap. I'm dashed if I'll put up with it, he muttered, and went and claimed the next turn the moment the pair paused for breath. How cross you look tonight, Sir George, Mrs. Charters said as they danced. My last partner was so agreeable and sympathetic. I want to wring his neck, was all the answer she got. And then he added, as they stopped and wandered off to a distant sofa in the gallery, I'm sure he's up to no good. I'd watch the silver if I were Jack Hardress. 
It is really remarkable to what depths of spite men will descend about one another, Estelle laughed as they sat down. No woman would be so transparent, and all just because Mr. Duval is a foreigner and has good manners and does not show moods, and she leaned back provokingly among the cushions. You like him? Sir George asked indignantly, and then aggrievedly, but anyone can see that. If you're going to be unpleasant, Mrs. Charters said, I shall leave you and dance with him again. He valses divinely. Sir George's eyes blazed. If you do, I will wring his neck. I could easily, he blurted out. Absurd brute force. And she smiled plaintively. Englishmen are so crude. How you do tease me, Estelle, Sir George said, and then stopped suddenly. Who told you you might call me that? Mrs. Charters frowned. A piece of impertinence. But here her voice faltered, for she saw that her companion was no longer listening to her. His eyes were fixed with an intense interest upon a picture which hung upon the wall opposite them, the portrait of a lady in late eighteenth-century dress, with the rather high waist and flowing white draperies, while her hair fell in ruffled, unpowdered curls. It was not by any celebrated artist, but was a pleasing picture, and as Estelle's eyes took it in, she knew why Sir George was so absorbed, for it bore a most wonderful likeness to herself. By Jove, was all he said. It certainly might have been painted from me, she allowed. Who can it be? But they could not find out. Their host, whom they questioned, did not know. He happened to be passing at that moment and joined them with his foreign guest. They had only taken the place from the Walworths for a year, he said and the Walworths had bought it just as it stood from someone else. It had changed hands once or twice, and he couldn't remember now who were the original owners. It is supposed to be a portrait of the ghost, I believe, he told them. Some old retainer informed Ada when we came, the white lady who haunts the library and the cedar chamber. Where I sleep, cried Estelle with a note of distress. Oh, Jack, I believe I am half afraid. I'll come and watch outside your door if you are, said Sir George. Then you can call me if you feel frightened in the night, and I will tackle any ghost for you. I should glory in the act. I do not doubt it, laughed the host, and discreetly walked on. But Mr. Ambrose Duval stayed behind, examining every turn of the brush in the picture with a critical eye. Estelle had grown very quiet, Sir George noticed, she suddenly felt again that strange sense of excitement, a cold, unpleasant feeling of tension and dread, and she looked up into his face with an appealing pair of soft grey eyes. "'Let's go and dance again,' she said. "'I want to get warm once more. I feel cold.' And Sir George joyfully encircled her slender waist and held her close as they rejoined the dancers and whirled about. "'Who sleeps next to me?' Mrs. Charters asked, as the laughing group of women went up to bed about one in the morning, but she heard with secret dismay that the only other room in this quaint square wing was a sitting-room, with a little oratory attached. "'You have always said you adored ghosts and weird things,' Mrs. Hardress said, "'or, dearest, I would not have put you in the cedar-room. "'So I do, of course,' returned Estelle rather half-heartedly. She was a proud woman, and ashamed to show her fears. Everything looked most bright and comfortable when she got to her room, and her devoted maid had waited up for her, and now put her to bed with every care. So, tired out with her dance, Estelle forgot her sense of uneasiness, and soon sank to sleep between the slippery fine sheets, while the dying fire made flickering lights in the vast room. But in the grey dawn she awoke in mortal fright, for she had dreamed again of the dark space, the escritoire, the parchment, and the drops of fresh blood, too. Next day was Christmas Eve, and much occupied with all sorts of bygone amusements, in which a Christmas tree for the children figured in the late afternoon. Everyone was particularly gay and cheerful, only Estelle Charters felt heavy as lead, her dream haunted her. It had certainly some meaning. It was the second time she had experienced it, and the certificate, the loss of which might make such a difference to her, could quite well look like the parchment on the desk. But why 
there should be any connection with it in this house, of which she had never heard until her friends had taken it, she could not imagine. And if there were some strange thread in it all, why should the picture of the ghost be like herself? The money she could be deprived of had been Algernon's money, and had not come to her through her own family at all, so it would be more sensible and seemingly in sequence if the ghost looked like him or one of her sisters-in-law. But she could not shake off the unaccountable depression she was filled with, and she tried to divert herself with Mr. Ambrose Duval's inspiriting conversation to the rage of Sir George, who had left Scotland on purpose to be present at this party and press his suit, feeling full of hope that she would show him some grace. But for some reason all had been at sixes and sevens between them, and this hateful foreigner appeared to be the cause. Towards the end of the day Sir George's temper had got the better of him, and he had finally gone off and talked to another woman in pique and disgust. And so, once more, the night came, and Estelle was left alone in the cedar room. Now the conduct of the foreign guest had excited suspicion as well as fury in the breast of Sir George, and he had watched him unconsciously most of the day. The brute had come to Ertonwood with some purpose. He now felt sure of that. Such extreme interest in all the rooms and the furniture was overdone if it were really an innocent fancy for old things. The library in particular seemed to have attracted him, and he even contrived to be shown the famous cedar chamber while he said the most insinuating and admiring things to its present occupant. They had gone there, a company of four or five after lunch, old Miss Harcourt amongst them, torn from her bridge. "'I would not sleep here for the world,' she said. "'I wonder how you can, Estelle. You must have nerves of iron and a conscience of snow-like purity. It makes me creep, even in broad daylight. I'm not afraid,' affirmed Mrs. Charters, raising her head. From there the group had returned to the library, and here Mr. Duval pointed to an old escritoire, which stood in one window, used now as a writing-table. Its surface seemed a good deal warped from the sunlight, which had come in upon it, presumably, for many years. "'This could be as the one you told us about in your dream,' Mr. Duval said, furtively watching her face. And Estelle recognised that it was indeed the same with a sharp thrill. But she laughed a little nervously as she evaded a direct reply. Mr. Duval was examining it closely, passing smooth, finely moving fingers over all its sides and top. There is probably some secret spring, he said. It would be amusing if your dream came true and it disclosed the parchment and the drops of blood. But for some reason Estelle did not wish him to find it, if there were any spring. She would examine it herself another time, with Ada alone, and Sir George, watching now intently, felt all sorts of queer ideas come into his head. By the time they said good night, the feeling that there was something going on underneath grew so strong that he determined not to undress or go to bed. He is going to have a try at opening that old bureau, I'd make any bet, he said to himself, and I'll balk him if I can and discover what is up. So he pretended to be tired and to go on to his room when the other men moved to the smoking-room, which was in a side-wing, after the ladies had left. But in reality he waited until he thought the butler would have extinguished the lights in the library and the middle part of the house. Then he lit his candle and softly crept down and stretched himself upon a sofa rather behind a screen while the dying embers of the fire shed a mysterious glow all over the rest of the room and in the cedar chamber Estelle, tired out and rather saddened at the estrangement which she had felt had grown up in the day between herself and her hitherto ardent would-be lover, got hastily into bed. It was her own fault, she knew. She had been most capricious and talked far too much to the foreign man, whom she realised now she rather disliked underneath. She had been foolish and nervous and jumpy to-day, and she felt quite ashamed of herself. But in a very short time she grew sleepy, and all became a blank until, with startling vividness, for the third time the dream returned, and to it was added a dim figure which seemed to beckon to her 
and compel her to rise and follow from her warm, soft bed. It seemed that she crept across the room to a panel beside the fireplace, fascinated but without fear following the ghostly shape which, when it turned its face, looked so strangely like herself, and the panel glided back, disclosing a dark opening, and still she was impelled to enter its black depths, and all the while, as she felt herself descending a narrow stair, a dim iridescence seemed like a nimbus to encircle the head of that faint wraith which was leading her on. Whither? Meanwhile, in the library, Sir George was almost dozing off to sleep on his sofa in the shadow of the screen. The clock had struck two, and the fire had burnt so very low that hardly a glow now illumined the room. But a broad shaft of moonlight came in from the top part of the window to which the shutters did not reach. It was composed of small panes with a coat of arms emblazoned in the centre, and the beams of the moon threw some weird shapes upon the floor and upon the old escritoire, which happened to stand in its path of light. Sir George thought to himself that he had, after all, perhaps been mistaken. The foreigner had probably gone to bed with the rest, and he too would turn in. Then, just as his meditations reached thus far, he heard the faintest noise of the door opening, and someone with stealthy footsteps, cautiously advanced up the room. As he sprang to his feet, he felt, rather than saw, that it was Ambrose Duval. He himself was securely hidden in the black shadow of the screen. The man went softly to the shutter of the moonlit window, and with quiet, nervous hands undid its old-fashioned bolt, letting in a still broader shaft of light, which now allowed every detail of the old bureau to be seen. Then he came eagerly to its side, and Sir George held his breath and leaned forward not to miss anything of what might be about to happen. Mr. Duval seemed to be feeling the lid, which he opened with care, and then a search began for the secret spring. And once or twice, as he looked up as if for inspiration, his face seemed like a fiend's in the ashen light. At last he appeared to have discovered something. A drawer flew open with a jerk, and he gave a sharp exclamation of pain. Some part of the steel spring had evidently wounded his hand. But his hesitation was only momentary. With frantic eagerness he now drew forth a roll from the secret place. It looked to Sir George like an old yellow parchment, and as Ambrose Duval bent to scrutinize it, with devilish satisfaction upon his face, there dropped from the cut on his hand some drops of blood. The scene was the exact reproduction of Mrs. Charters's dream. This was the moment Sir George felt for him to interfere. But before he could take more than a step, he was arrested by seeing the thief raise his head, and then start and grow livid and shaking with abject terror as he gazed into a far corner, the parchment dropping from his nerveless fingers back onto the old desk, and Sir George, following the direction of his eyes, also experienced a thrill which even in him was not unmixed with something akin to fear. For both men could just distinguish, slowly and noiselessly advancing toward them out of the shadow from a part of the room where there was no door, the tall slender figure of a woman in a rather short-waisted white garment with ruffled curls of unpowdered hair. She seemed to be ethereal and unreal, but when she got into the moonlight the likeness was unmistakable. The face was the same as the picture in the gallery which the host had told them represented the Ertonwood ghost. The great grey eyes were wide and staring like the eyes of a corpse, and the whole figure moved slowly with a gliding motion unlike life. My God! Is it a stell? Sir George gasped to himself as he waited the turn of events. If it were his well-beloved, then she must be walking in her sleep. If the denizen of some other world, then something strange and awful might develop when she got to the escritoire. In either case, his best course would be to watch and be ready to spring. 
for he fully realised the securing of the parchment was to Ambrose Duval for some reason a matter of desperate need. The figure advanced, growing more clear as it reached the goal. Duval was now crouching, an almost inert mass, some paces back, in mortal fright. The lady, whoever or whatever she was, put out a transparent-looking hand in the moonlight, and seizing the parchment was gliding back again from when she came, but Ambrose Duval gave the hiss of a snake as he saw the precious paper being taken from his grasp, and with a half-articulate cry of rage and terror bounded forward. But Sir George was quicker than he, and ere he could reach the ghost or woman, he found himself pinioned in the Englishman's strong arms. Then the two men struggled, Ambrose Duval with mad fear in his breast at this new foe, and Sir George with cool determination to frustrate his opponent's ends. As they tottered together they both saw, with an indescribable thrill, the figure disappear as it were before their eyes into the darkness of the wall, and they knew they were alone. Was she a ghost, or real flesh and blood? That was a question which neither could decide. But now that there was no more reason to protect Estelle, if it were she, Sir George let Mr. Duval go. He was breathless from rage and fright, and staggered to a chair. How dare you attack me like this? he exclaimed furiously, drawing a revolver from his pocket and pointing it at his foe. But Sir George, far more perturbed at the thought of what might have become of his lady love, took no notice of him. He walked over to the fire and poked up the dying embers, which threw up a last small flame, giving enough light for him to find his candlestick, which he had put down beside the sofa in the gloom, beyond the shaft of moonlight. Mr. Duval followed him, still livid from fear of the supernatural, and mad with rage at his failure and loss. "'You shall answer to me for this now with your life!' he snarled. "'In that case, you will be hanged for murder,' Sir George retorted coolly. You had better go quietly in the morning before I denounce you as a thief. I am no thief, Mr. Duval protested violently. How dare you attack a guest in our friend's house in this most murderous fashion? It is I who can denounce you. You must give me satisfaction for this. I shall do nothing of the kind, said Sir George. I should not think of dueling with a thief. Just take my advice and go in the morning without a scandal and prosecute your scheming tricks elsewhere. I have seen all you did, remember, and can describe it well. Then the two men glared at one another there in the old library, the one candle illuminating their angry faces, and the great shaft of moonlight lighting the rifled escritoire. And then Sir George calmed himself. You can take what course you please, he said. I have a pistol too, and he drew his small derringer from the pocket where he had been holding it. I am a rather good shot sometimes so we may each hit the other, but there is no use in it, and rats like you are fond of life. This reflection seemed to carry weight with Mr. Duval, unflattering as it was, for it is quite one thing to shoot at an unarmed man, and quite another to find him possessed of a pistol too. With what dignity he could, Mr. Duval now drew himself up and prepared to leave the room. You have won this time, he said between his teeth, but some day... I will level things up. I am quite indifferent about that, Sir George answered hurriedly. Get out now, and get away by the earliest train. I shall give you so much a start. Now I have other and more important things to do. Go. And he almost drove Duval to the door and up to his room. Then, when he had seen him safely shut in, he paused to think what was the next thing to be done. To awaken Jack Hardress and his wife and ascertain if Estelle was safe in her cedar chamber seemed to be the best move. So, after some difficulty, he found his host's apartment and knocked firmly on the door. Yes, what is it? Jack Hardress called out sleepily, and Ada's frightened voice piped, Oh, who, who's there? Then Sir George explained in as few words as he could, when his host and hostess, clothed in dressing gowns, appeared in the passage, and they, all three, carrying lights, set off for the cedar room. But here was deathly silence. No answer came to their knocks, nor could they enter. The door was locked from within. A sickening, icy hand clutched at Sir George's heart. What had happened? Some ill had befallen Estelle. 
If we both rush to the door together, we can break the lock, Jack, he said desperately. We must not delay an instant, now. And the two men hurled themselves against the stout panels, but, though they shivered, they held. Then, with the strength of despair, Sir George made a rush by himself, and the bolt gave, and he fell headlong into the room. But alas, Ada's two candles, which she held high, revealed no occupant. The bed had been slept in and left hastily, the clothes were turned back, but there was no sign of Estelle. The three people looked at each other with blanched faces. What mystery was here? Sir George began hastily to examine the walls. It followed, his common sense told him, if the door were locked from within, his beloved lady had left the apartment by some other means. The windows were out of the question, they were too high, and besides were closed and the orange curtains drawn. There must be some secret panel, and Estelle must have walked in her sleep. But how weird it all was! And he was filled with dread and foreboding as he felt each part of the wall. We must discover the entrance, Jack, he said. I saw Mrs. Charters, or her ghost, with my own eyes in the library, and she disappeared at the end of the room. Now, with terrified eagerness, the three set to work, feeling and tapping each cedar panel, while Ada Hardress called continually, Estelle! Estelle! Answer if you're there and can hear us! But only silence greeted them. And as the hopelessness of their task made itself felt, a sickening fear grew and grew in each of their hearts. What if she had fallen down some deep secret place, some oubliette, and were dead? They might pull all the house down, and yet be too late. At last Ada, almost weeping from grief and fright, subsided upon the sofa, while her husband and Sir George, rigid and grey with anxiety, faced each other to decide what to do. "'Wake the servants and send for a mason and carpenter,' Sir George said. "'And meanwhile, can't we get an axe and some tools? I will tear the woodwork down myself, when I have an implement.' Mrs. Hardress went off to wake the household and send for the required men. "'And get a doctor, too,' Sir George called. And when some tools were found by a frightened footman and brought, he set to work with such a will that at last the steel bolt was discovered, and the panelling giving way by the fireplace, a very small narrow door was disclosed in the stonework. The bolts in connection with it were stiff and rusted with age, and how a delicate woman could have moved them was a profound mystery. The door gave way without much difficulty, and here, by the light of a lamp held high, the very narrowest passage was revealed, which in three paces developed into a stair. It was so extremely narrow that Sir George was obliged to force his broad shoulders through until he came to the descent. Suddenly, at a sharp turn, he could see the steps rising again on the opposite side. But there, in the space beneath, lay the figure of a woman in white. With an exclamation of anguish he saw that it was Estelle, but was she dead? He handed the lamp to Jack Hardress, who was behind him, and in a second he was beside his love, and had raised her in his arms with difficulty in the confined space, and even in the excitement he noticed that she still clutched in her hand the paper which seemed to have been the cause of all the tragic events of the night. He detached it from her fingers, and saw that the blood drops had smeared her hand as he put the paper in his pocket and lifted her in his arms to carry her back. A bruise marked where her forehead had struck a projecting stone in the wall. Perhaps she was only stunned and not dead. This hope gave him the strength of a lion, and he clasped her close. But their exit was no easy task. The space had been narrow enough for one person here and there, and was impossible for a man cumbered with a woman in his arms. Jack Hardress retreated before them, holding the lamp high, and when Sir George came to a turn that he could not pass, he was obliged to lay his precious burden down and let Jack Hardress pull her through by the arms. Then he lifted her up again, and so at last all three were safe in the cedar room, where a thrilled and excited group awaited them, including the doctor who had now arrived. The room was cleared of all but Ada, Sir George and Estelle's maid, while the doctor bent over the inanimate form, and at last he looked up and announced, No, uh, she's not dead, and never were more grateful words sent up to heaven than Sir George's fervent, Thank God, she was not dead then, his darling, 
and soon she might open her eyes and look into his own. He could afford to wait in the passage now, as he told the good news to the rest of the alarmed guests. And presently the doctor and Mrs. Hardress came out, and he heard that his beloved was conscious and rapidly recovering. Uh, she must have walked in her sleep, the physician said, and her head struck a stone, uh, but it was the stifling air which made her faint, though no doubt she was stunned too by the blow. If you had been an hour later in finding her, I think she could not have lived. So after all there were rejoicings on that Christmas morning, which seemed as though it was going to dawn so tragically, and in the excitement of it all no one thought then to remark upon Mr. Ambrose Duval's departure by the one and only early train. His note of farewell to his hostess was a masterpiece, and caused Sir George to smile as she handed it to him to read. Late in the afternoon he was allowed to see his sweet lady in Ada's own sitting-room, alone and in peace. She was lying on the sofa with a bandage round her forehead, but her small face looked ghastly pale against the blue silk cushions, but her eyes shone and she stretched out her hands as he bent upon his knees to be near her. George, you were good to me, she whispered, and I can't take care of myself. But she could not say any more, because he stopped and kissed her lips, and for some while they were too happy to talk of even a subject so interesting as her dream and the adventure it produced. But at last they became sane enough to examine the parchment which proved to be the certificate of marriage between John Charter's bachelor and Marjorie Wildacre spinster, celebrated at a little village in Leicestershire, in the year 1795. So the Urtonwood ghost had stood Estelle in good stead. From here was her fortune secured beyond any doubt. But who then was Mr. Ambrose Duval, and what was his connection with the affair, and why did Estelle herself resemble the picture of the Urtonwood ghost? These were questions which it would take time to answer. Though what does anything matter? exclaimed Sir George after a while, since I have enough for us both, and since you cannot take care of yourself, and are going to let me. It was not before the happy pair returned from their honeymoon that all the mystery was unravelled. The lawyers had been busy investigating the while. It appeared that Lady Marjorie Wildacre had lived at Ertonwood, which was her old home, her father having sold it when they went to Italy. She had had a daughter by her second husband, the Italian Count, who eventually married the great-grandfather of Estelle, thus carrying the likeness into her family. And Estelle often loves to weave romance round her dream, and imagine how, influenced by this far-back ancestress's unquiet spirit, she must have been drawn to go to the Urtonwood Christmas party and participate in the events which followed. You see, George, she probably loved the Italian Count, Estelle told her husband, and wanted their descendant by him to benefit too. That is why she directed me. But I cannot help being sorry for poor Mr. Duval. Loathsome foreigner, was all Sir George said. His real name was Charters, and he was the claimant to the fortune, but he chose to take his mother's name. She had been a Frenchwoman, the better to pursue his investigations unsuspected. He had got hold of some letter among the papers of his branch of the family which referred to the certificate being at Urtonwood and Lady Marjorie's residence there, and hearing that his chance acquaintances, the hardresses, had taken this place, he cultivated them in order to have access for his search, determining, when he found the certificate, he would destroy it, and then with certainty prosecute his claim. But fate takes care of things and arranges what she thinks best, and even the thoroughly English Sir John Seafield is obliged to own that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in our philosophy. If you like that story, consider supporting me as a patron. That way you help me make more stories for you and get access to a patrons-only library of stories. Lots more hours for you to listen to. So that was The Urtonwood Ghost by Eleanor Glynn. And I got this from um, an anthology called Ghosts for Christmas, by edited by Richard Dolby. I think it's from 1989 or something. He edited a lot of anthologies in the 80s. Um, yeah, it's later than 87 anyway. Let me just check. 89, yeah, I was right. So um, Eleanor Glynn. 
Another woman writer, much better known for her writings in an entirely different genre, was Eleanor Glynn, born 1864, died 1943. World famous for her sensational novels and the creation of It, the indefinable sex appeal, which catapulted Clara Bow to equal fame under Eleanor Glynn's tuition in Hollywood during the 1920s. Four years after the tremendous success of her bestseller Three Weeks, 1907, Eleanor Glynn was commissioned to write this story of a strange haunting for the Christmas number of Pearson's magazine in December 1911. So it came out in 1911. And so this is before the First World War, which is probably significant. Um, you can see that, uh, yeah, we have, character-wise, we have the plain-speaking, honest, brave, strong, straightforward, very English Sir George Seafield. We have the slimy, treacherous foreigner, dark-skinned foreigner, even if he's only French, you know, and uh, that to those people there, that was, uh, you know, everything vile and untrustworthy was foreign and uh, everything damn fine was English. And we, we need to um, be clear that we mean English there. Not the Scots, not the Irish, not the Welsh, but the English. Funnily enough, uh, my, my mother, I was going through some of her papers. She's still, she's, she is still with us, but um, she's increasingly unwell. So I was going through some, and I found um, a letter um, addressed to my stepfather when he was a boy. So probably dating from the 19th, well, it must have been after the war, because we were talking about Anarin Bevan, who founded the NHS. And they were tremendous Tories, my stepfather's family. And... Um, they, and they said this, this odious idea of the NHS and founded by a Welshman of all things. So there was this um, pretty chauvinistic view that, yeah, just like that, straightforward English, honest, you can trust an Englishman, you can't trust a foreigner. And, and of course, the portrayal of women is probably going to have, <laughs> or everybody who has a, an ounce of feminism in them uh, up in arms because there she is, she can't look after, she admits she can't look, you know, this, this pretense that women can look after themselves is, is shown to be just that. She needs to be rescued by a straightforward, honest Sir George. And, um, you know, all, all the, her, and she's such a coquette, isn't she? You can't, you know, she's, and she even knows that the women, are like they, oh, they find this foreign chap very attractive, but they know that he's no good because, of course, he's foreign. And um, but she but she's such a coquette that she teases that straightforward St. George, St. George, and he called him. But there's probably, um, you know, something in that. Um, so there we are. So uh, and uh, yeah, all the characters are completely two dimensional. Um, but we have the Gothic, we have the castle, the old house, we have the ghost, we have the secret passages. All of that's great. We have the lovely Christmas party. I would have liked more Christmas stuff. But um, oh, but it was all right. So it is the kind of I think if you've read things like the op I've you know read the Open Door, these these kind of rollicking, um, very straightforward. These are things that appeared in magazines. They weren't intended to be high literature. They weren't intended to look at the condition of of the human soul or say important things about the world. They were just intended to entertain by by bringing out the old tropes, and here we have them. So. There we are. But Eleanor Glynn is an interesting character in herself. I'm actually going to um, put a link to a YouTube uh, um, thing, and it's Eleanor Glynn uh, in 1930 explains it. So it is what, what certain women have, um, which is, I guess, sex appeal, um, some kind of attractiveness. And it was all about, have you got it? What is it? You know, so, um, yeah, I'll put a link to that. It's really interesting. In in the movie, she talks like the late queen. Um, it's very very it it it. It's all all the vowels are raised right up. Uh, anyway, Eleanor Glynn, born October seventeenth, eighteen sixty four, Jersey Channel Islands, died September twenty third, nineteen forty three, London. English novelist and short story writer, known for her highly romantic tales with luxurious settings and improbable plots. As a young child, Glynn read widely and precociously in her family library. Although she did not have any formal education, such friends as Lord Curzon, so they are top-notch aristocracy. Um, Lord Milner and F.H. Bradley later filled in her, the gaps in her knowledge. 
Her first book, The Visits of Elizabeth, was an epistolary, hard to say, novel consisting of a group of letters from a young girl to her mother that described the foibles and philanderings of a group of European aristocrats. First serialized in the world, it was published in her book in book form in 1900. Her acute powers of observation of the milieu in which she lived were evident in the work. Uh, she wrote very um, society novels, Three Weeks, 1907, the story of a Balkan queen's adulterous relationship with an Englishman cause a sensation. His hour, one of her best romances, was set in the court of St. Petersburg, clearly before the Russian Revolution, and was executed in the keenly observant style. In 1916, she wrote The Career of Catherine Bush, uh, the first novel in which her heroine was not of aristocratic birth. Um, after 1916, Glynn was forced to write out of necessity, having fallen deeply in debt, and her husband died the following year. In 1920, she began her career as a scriptwriter in Hollywood, where a number of her own novels were filmed, including Three Weeks and It, 1927, we talked about that, which had an American setting. The film version of It for some years made the word It a synonym for sex appeal. Unable to manage her finances in Hollywood, she returned to England in 1929. She completed her autobiography, Romantic Adventure, in 1936. Um, so there you go, that, that's her, and then um, she dies at some point. So... She's like the Kardashians. I mean, I, I would imagine she herself was, you know, she's making a living and she had the privilege to be, so she died in 1943 during the war, but she had the privilege to be um, born in that society. And do you know what? Um, ordinary people love all of that. People who just live ordinary lives, they love the romance of the, just imagining, you know, it could be the, these billionaire romances, you know, about how ordinary women meet. This is the kind of same kind of thing. They meet billionaires who uh, probably, and some of them do, despicable things to them, but um, I think that's Shades of Grey, isn't it? I haven't seen that or read it. But, um, oh, no, I'm far too, too you know, I, yeah. But, uh, yes, indeed. So. It's like the Kardashians, that's what she is. She's like that that kind of, that all those awful Hollywood, the, the Housewives of Orange County or something, you know, except posher. But, um, but there we are, you know, and sometimes, I was just reading something about Conan Doyle, because on the, um, just to mention, drop a mention, I've just started the Classic Detective Stories podcast, the sister podcast of this one, which you can find on YouTube and on Spotify, Classic Detective Stories. Um, Tony Walker, that's me. Uh, now, I did a, a Sherlock Holmes on that, and um, I was reading about C Conan Doyle. In you know, I tell you, I read this um, magazine, quarterly magazine called Slightly Foxed about books, and somebody was doing a review of um, uh, The Hound of the Baskervilles and talking about how good it was. And Conan Doyle, where well, was a point then? I had a point, and then I got carried away talking about The Hound of the Baskervilles, and um, now I'm lost. But it is late and it's really cold. I've got f about five layers on here. So, yeah, uh, Detective Stories podcast. What was it? Yeah, go and listen to that, please. Uh, and I hope you like it. Oh, yeah, I've got guest guest uh, narrators on it. So Jasper Lestrange of the Encrypted Horror podcast has very kindly done me a guest um, detective story, which it, it'll be out next Saturday, I think. I've, I've just edited it today. So, uh, and I, I didn't need to edit his work, but I added my bits and stuff to it. So I've done that. Um, yeah, so that's all go. Oh, and if, if it's, you're still listening to this before Christmas, remember it's not too late to get one of my Christmas books from my Etsy store. So at some point, if you look up on YouTube, uh, you'll see an Etsy link. If you don't, it's Classic Ghost Stories podcast on Etsy. Go and have a look and buy some, buy some merchandise or something. You can, you can wear stickers. The, the, um, you can get T-shirts, but not through that. Now, somebody very, yeah. Anyway, somebody very. I said that. Listen, the problem with sending books to the USA is it's massively expensive. And somebody said, "Can I not set up an Etsy store in the US?" Well, I could, but I'd still need to ship the books over, and then I'd need to pay somebody in the US to mail them out. So uh, I'd be no better off, really. So I'm not going to do that. If you want to get my books and you don't live in the UK, you're not true Englishman. If you if you don't do that, then just um, order it from the bookstore, your local bookstore. You can go online. You go to your bookstore and go, can I run up Tony Walker's books, please, about ghosts, and uh, they'll they'll know exactly what you mean. Um, 
I probably there's probably things I need to say, but I have nothing to say. Well, that's not true, is it? That is just not true. I have lots to say, but nothing necessarily important. That doesn't stop me though. Um, okay, that's about it. So there we are, a, a Christmas ghost story of a kind. Yeah, yeah, it was a ghost story. It was a Christmas. Yeah, it was mar- marvelously gothic. Imagine what that hall looked like at that Christmas party. It would be like Hogwarts, wouldn't it? It would be amazing. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be invited to a party like that and not actually be one of the staff, but be one of the guests? So you, you, you're just having a good time. And um, But there we are. So, yeah, it was what it was. It was what it was. I enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. But uh, it is the equivalent. It's not. It's lowbrow. But that's fine. We can be that. We can be that. Um, we don't have to be. We don't have to be reading Nabokov all the time. And um, who else is higher, Brown? Proust, of course. One has read both of those, of course. But um, you know, yeah. I had to say that, didn't I? Just to, I had to say that. I hate myself for that. Anyway, I hope you're all well. Um, I hope you're enjoying the freezing cold. I actually, don't mind. I had a lovely walk with the dogs today. Um, Ruby, not Ruby, Ruby's still on the holidays so it was Callie and Jasper and they had their coats on they've got these coats, they don't like their coats it subdues them a bit but we walked around because it was snowing there was nobody much about and then the snow stopped and the sun came out and loads of people came out with the dogs but we had a nice walk uh, out in the wilds we didn't see anybody for a bit and they, had, they did enjoy the snow they, they've never seen snow before this is the first snow they've seen because they, they weren't here this, this time last year so my pups, um, my puppy pups, um, there we are, and everybody's okay, really. My two girls are okay. My mother's all right, she's getting better. Um, she'd been ill again, and uh, um, you can tell she's getting better because she gets um, crabbier, really. Uh, and so she is a little bit crabby at the moment, So, but that, this is life. But what's it, what it, one good thing has happened has been I was looking for paperwork. We had to kind of do financial claims and for a care and all sorts. And I ended up going and finding a load of old pictures, a load of old photographs that she's had in drawers for years and years and years. So it was nice that the past is never really gone, you know. It's just we can't see it. I do actually believe that. Um, so you don't lose anybody. Um, it's just they're in a slightly different place that you can't see right now. But you will. You will, you will. Anyway, with that cheery thought... On a freezing cold night, I will um, say good night. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some dies, come back. Don't they? Isn't that so? Isn't that so? Isn't that so? Isn't that so?